Hey, welcome to part 2 of the LangChain tutorial. And today we're going to look at one of the most commonly requested workflow, which is to use a large language model, like GPT for example, to ask questions on your own database, or you're on the CSV file, or even a SQLite database. This should be very practical seeing that everyone above the age of 6 has a database, or they find ways to persist their data in some form of a tabular format like the CSV. If you're an 80-year-old grandmother of 3, guess where you're storing your gardening inventory, or home recipes? Exactly, in a CSV file. So let's continue from where we left off in part 1, we're using the same environment, no new dependencies. If you want to follow along, either watch the first one to get some background of what LangChain is, or just put a pause, go to the, go fork the repo, do a pip install and then resume the video. If you're ready, let's just create a new file, let's just name it demo2.p1, and you can begin with the imports. We know we're going to need to use LangChain, so let's might as well just bring that in. We know we're going to use the OpenAI model, so let's do that. And I also want to bring in the database and the SQL database chain, and I'm going to explain both of this in a second. Now, this directory is exactly the same as in the last video, in part 1 of this series. The only difference is that I had a new directory here called Academy, and I'm going to give you a quick preview of the CSV file. Now, I'm not going to be able to show you all of the columns because um, it would expose the email addresses and such. And these are actually, this is a real life data set, contains real information, my customer's information, his first name, last name, addresses and stuff. You can think of them as being, you know, exported from a CRM or from a survey form, right? That's, that's, uh, that's how you can think of it. I'm going to close it now. In an academy.db, this is a SQLite file. Converting from a CSV file to a SQLite file takes about three to five lines of code. Very, very simple. If you want to um, have, if you have a CSV file and you want to practice SQL, on the CSV file, then you can either use .db. Um, I have a video covering that. You should uh, I'll put the link in the description. You should go and take a look at it. Or open up SQLite and just do a conversion from C CSV file uh, going to a SQLite file. That takes about three lines of code. So I also have a video for that. And I'm also going to put the link in the video description. So if you want to check that out, feel free to do that. Okay, I'm going to assume that you have your own CSV file and you have your own um, you know, SQLite file, database file, you, or you can have a remote database server running somewhere, right? All you need to do is to be able to specify your database uh, URI, so that would be wherever that is. So this could be some Azure DB running, this could be some Postgre running somewhere, it could any anywhere, right? Um, another kind of very common workflow is to have something, if you use like bash, maybe this could be in your bash, RC or G shell GRC and then you would have something like dot uh, OS and then you can say get env and then you would have your I don't know how you name it but you could you might name it database URL for example that could that is also one uh, common workflow all right so as long as you can specify that DB URI you should be able you should be good right I'm gonna remove all of that because I'm not even gonna use that I'm just gonna read it from this if you don't have any SQLite and you don't want to learn how to convert a CSV to a SQLite file, go to my GitHub. There's a ton of fake dummy uh, SQLite file that you can download and play around with that, okay? In my case here, I'm going to use SQLite and I'm going to pre slashes and I'm going to specify the path to this. So this is academy slash academy.db, right? So the first academy refers to this folder, that's the name of that, and the second one of that is academy.db. And why do you call it academy? Because I run a data science school called Algorithma Data Science Academy, and this data is actually exported from that, which is why I can't share with you. I can share with you other SQLites, you can use it. It doesn't matter, okay? And then you create a second line to just say, okay, this is my URI, uh, this class, instantiate a class from that. So you could go ahead and say something like SQL, database, then you say from, URI, and then you pass in your URI. And that's it. So this is the only line you need to change right now at this stage, right? You want to, you want to either use a relative path, you want to pass in a direct path. Uh, ideally, you don't want to do that because it's probably very sensitive information unless you're just running this on your local computer, that's fine. But if you're doing any kind of real database, you don't want to do that. You want to use something like a, a, a putting that into your .env file, in your .env file, and then from here, you just do a lot load. Uh, so I'll show you how to do that. So you can say from .env import load .env, and then from here, make one call to load.env and just call it. So this will load all your environment variables from the .env file. So all you need to do is to create a .env file and you specify the file there and then make sure that that is not in your git uh, commits. So put the git enough file in there and then just ignore that file right away, right? So you don't want to have this persisted uh, anywhere. You don't want to accidentally commit them onto GitHub. But now that you have dburi and you have db, the next step is actually very, very similar to what we did in the first video. So we're going to have LLM and we're going to say something like this. We're going to say openai 
and we're gonna initialize with a few parameters. Here, for example, we just do the simplest thing. We say it's temperature equals to zero. So temperature controls how varied the answers are. If you wanna set a temperature of one or close to one, for example, it's gonna try to be a bit more wild, a bit more random, a bit more unpredictable. Temperature zero is a bit more deterministic in a way, right? So the closer to zero, the more deterministic it get and the more conservative the answers get to. So in this case here, we're not gonna try and make it, unless you're doing some sort of very creative writing, creative prompt, then you can have a higher temperature. You're trying to do something like, um, you know, helping you write a Noel or write a song, you can set the temperature to be you know, 0.7, for example. Uh, in our case here, I'm gonna build a q and I'm gonna query my database, but in natural language, right? So I wanna query in natural language, get some answers from the DB. So I don't want my temperature to be high. I don't want it to try anything too well. I just want it to be a bit more deterministic, uh, more predictable and that's that's why it's just uh, temperature zero. All right, so let's go ahead and now create a chain and this chain would just be SQL database chain and SQL database chain is going to take three parameters. Actually just two, it's just going to take two parameters. The first one is the LLM. So in LLM, we actually already have the LLM. So all you need to do is you just pass that back in and then you need the database and in this case here, it's just the DB that you create, that's it. But I want to see the step by step that it's doing each step. So I'm gonna say will both equals to true and that will do it. And that is kind of how you set up the chain and 10 lines of code, actually if you remove the spaces, seven lines of code, you're done, all right? So let's go ahead now and maybe uh, try to query our database now in natural language, try to get some prompt. Ultimately, this is still a SQL database. It still needs to execute SQL queries, it cannot execute English. So GPT has the job of doing a translation, of taking English, translate that into SQL, and then execute the SQL against your database. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So DB chain, um, let's do a few one, right? So let's do the first one, we, let's run that, and let's do uh, how many, let's start with a sim something simple. How many rows is in the responses table? So how many rows is in the responses table? Of this DB. Something very, very, very simple should be able to generate the SQL. So if GPT is smart enough, it would take this sentence, convert that to the, the select, and then it would just select count from responses and just return the count and say, oh, it's, it has 25,000 rows of data. That's good enough for me, right? Now we're gonna maybe up the difficulty a bit. We're gonna try and make something a bit more interpretative, a bit more open ended. We're gonna say, try to describe the table for me. Describe the response table for me, right? Something more open-ended. We also gonna add a few more, um, maybe one or two more. So start another one, let's say, um, let's take a look at the CSV file. There is the country column, so there is the Indonesia, there's U United States, there are, uh, there's a few more, Hong Kong, Singapore, all right? So I'm gonna ask you to summarize that. I'm gonna say, what are the top three countries where this responses are from? So I'm gonna, something a bit more uh, tricky, you need to be able to summarize that and then find top three. And so I'm gonna ask that question there. And I'm gonna have the last one here. So I'm gonna say DB chain, run, and I wanna maybe have something a little bit more difficult, a bit more special, a bit more different. I will try to ask GPT to try and generate a summary. So give me a summary of how these customers uh, came to hear about us. Right, and maybe maybe add a bit more context. I said, what is the most common ways they hear about us? And that should do it. Four questions, um, very very simple. Let's go ahead, open up our terminal, push this to the side. This file is called demo2.py, so I'm just gonna say Python and demo2.py, and let's run it. Done, all right, that's pretty fast. Let's go ahead and take a look at the answers. So the first one, it says entering new SQL database chain. How many rows is in the responses table of this DB? This just should be easy. I, I even give you the answer already. I said, just do a select count uh, from response and you should get the answer. And so it, it says here, this is the SQL query it used. So it has to do the job of taking my English, convert that to SQL, run that, give me the SQL query, generate a result and then finalize with an answer. It needs to do a couple of things there, right? So you couldn't just go ahead and arrive at this answer. It couldn't do that. It has to derive the answer from the result, which is further derived from the SQL query, all right? So there are altogether 207 rows in the responses table of this DB. Okay, fair enough. Let's look at the second question. 
describe the response table. So what it does is very interesting. Instead of using any kind of like describe, it does a select all from response limit five. It looks at all of them and then it tries to formulate an answer by looking at all of them. So I'm not sure. Um, limit five, it tries to take a look at the first five rows. I will need to censor some of this part because some of the emails are showing right here. But uh, okay, that, that's, uh, that's something I'm going to have to do. So I, I cannot show you my customer's email. Not that I'm not, not, not that I don't trust you or anything, but it's a violation of YouTube's policy. So I have to uh, put a black box around this area when, by the time I come to editing. Okay, the next one. The response table contains 15 columns. So it gave you the number of these columns, give you the names of these columns. The third question, what are the top three countries where these responses are from? So this is the SQL query. It needs to, again, translate the English to SQL. It says select country, con country, as con from response. This looks about right to me and it generates the um, SQL result and then it generates the answer. The top three countries where these responses are from are Indonesia, Vietnam, and the United States. Okay, fair enough. The last one, give me a summary of how these countries or how these customers came to hear about us. What is the most common way that they hear about us? So I didn't even put that correctly, but okay. So it first does this, it says select, how do you hear about us? Because it realized that to answer this question, uh, he, he needs to figure out the right columns to look at. And it figures out out of the different 15 different columns, the column that really matters to it is the how do you hear about us column, which is quite smart, right? So there are 15 columns. It looks at this and says, what, which columns would contain the clue to this answer? Well, it could be the uh, this this column, so this column, particular column called the how do you hear about this column, and it does a generate, it does a count, uh, does a group by, and then finally it produces this nice aggregation table. Search engine seventy six, social media and online ads fifty four, media publishing thirty seven, email uh, eight, and then others uh, two. Um, we have a partner called Coinworks, so that's two. So the most common way customers heard about us is through search engines followed by social media, online ads, media publishing, email, and others columns. So that's quite neat because if it has to figure out out of all these columns and figure out which one contains the answers, it generates the SQL to do that for you, right? So that's pretty nice. Okay, so that's how you use LangChain against your SQL, um, SQLite or SQL database, all right? Um, but what about using it with a CSV file? So let's go ahead and create a new file. Um, I'm gonna say demo3.py. By now, there's a lot of things that are similar, so I'm just gonna copy off that, and I'm gonna remove things that I don't need, so which is probably off that. So I'll keep the dot and I'll keep the length chain, maybe not all of them, maybe just the first open AI. But now I'm using CSV. So I'm gonna look at my CSV file and try to query, do a QA against my CSV file. So to do that, I'm gonna bring in a loader. So I'm gonna say from length chain dot document loaders dot CSV loader import CSV loader. Alright? And then I'm gonna just load all my environments and I'm gonna have to specify my file path. So let's do my file path. Let's say academy. This is the name of my folder again, remember that. And then I'm gonna say this is academy.csv file because that's what I name it. Then I will just have to specify my loader and my loader is just from the class instance here, CSV loader. So I'm gonna just create an instance of that, pass in my file path, done. Now, once I have my file path, I loaded that, I haven't really read the data in there. So let me read that in, I'm gonna call it data. I'm gonna say loader.load. And then if you want to, you could just print the data, I guess. All right, if you were to run all of this, let me clear my screen. Let me say Python demo3.py. You should be able to see all the CSV for, okay, so all of that is printed. Again, I would have to maybe censor this out because I can't show you the email addresses um, of the customers. But it turns out that LangChain has something even easier for, for you. And it uses this concept called the agents. I'm gonna make a video on it in the future about what agents are. For now, let's just go ahead and just import that. So I'm gonna say from langchain.agents import create CSV agent and now I no longer need the CSV loader and I will no longer need this loader as well so I'm going to delete that delete this as well all right so let's clean that up as well let's create the LLM and this is the same as the last code example that you see here so basically this line just copy that and then let's create an agent so agent equals to create CSV agent and then what do we need we need the LLM we need the file path we need we say we're both equals to true because we want to Again, we want to see the method, we want to see it break down, right? Now I want to mention that the, the if you look at the documentation, this agent calls the pandas data frame agent under the hood, right? So this is actually using pandas data frame. So what it means is that it, uh, uh, when you use this agent, it calls the pandas data frame, which in turn calls the Python agent, which then execute the LLM generated Python code. So it's going to have to generate the Python code for you, then you have to execute it for you, and then give you the answers for it. Um, this could be potentially bad if the LLM generated Python code is actually harmful. So you need to know what 
the code is doing, set the variable stroke, uh, set the variable, set the variable's flag to be true, and see this process unfold, right? And make sure that uh, the Python code is not harmful. And by harmful, what I really mean is that you don't want this Python code to be accessing um, different things on your folder, on your directory, or, or looking at your systems, looking at your OS, or maybe injecting some kind of code, or maybe opening up some sort of path. You don't want it to do that. So you want to set verbose to true so that you can see what it actually is doing under the hood. So I like to set it to be verbose to true. I, I guess that you know maybe if it doesn't matter to you too much, um, and you have a lot of faith in our future overlord, then uh, I guess you can set it off to be false, right? So let's go ahead and uh, ask a few questions. Agent run so let's ask maybe three four questions as well same thing as the same drill so the first question what percentage of the respondents are students versus professionals that's something that matters to us because we run a coding boot camp we want we, we care about how many of our students are actually students how, how many of our students are actually pro working professionals just trying to upskill themselves so let's ask that first question then the second question would be something like this we could be something like list the top three devices um that the respondents use to submit their responses. And then finally, let's do a third one, um, and that'll be it. So let's say consider iOS and Android. This is a bit gonna be a bit harder. This is gonna be a bit trickier. Why is that? Because if you look at the data set in here in the CSV file, there is a column here that actually says that, uh, you know, what is the, the OS's? And it has like Mac and iOS and Android and stuff. So I want it to basically be smart enough to consider iOS and Android as mobile devices. And then I want to say something like, what are the percentages? Or what are the percentage? What is the percentage? Not what are. What is the percentage of respondents that discovered us through social media uh, submitting this from a mobile device? And that's about it. So we have all the three questions. We're good to go. We should be able to just run it. So let's run all of that. Say Python demo tree dot py, and let's see the agent executed chain. So the first question. And and you know what's really interesting is that it breaks down the thoughts for you. So it says the first one, right? What percentage of the respondents are students versus professionals? It says, I need to know how many respondents are students and how many are professionals. This is the thought, right? Then, so it does an action. The action is listed here as well. And then it does the input. Remember how I said that they actually just delegate that to Python, uh, to Pandas? And then Pandas would then generate the right Python code to just query that, right? To, to generate the answers. So Pandas would do this. If you're familiar with Pandas, you'll see this. Um, you probably know how to write this yourself. It says, look at the occupation and then generate the value cons, for example. And then here you get the students 25%, professionals 75%. So that's pretty good, pretty good, pretty smart. Second question, list the top three devices that the respondents use to submit their responses. So again, the thought process, I need to find out which devices are most commonly used. So it start off with that. It says, take the device column, do a value cons, find the top, uh, top three, and then it did, uh, gets the answer, phone and tablet. So what are the top three devices? Uh, it just gives you two, just phone and tablet. So... Uh, on, uh, the, oh, no, that's actually desktop as well. So yeah, desktop 185, phone 17, and tablet 5. So that's those are the top three devices. All right, cool. Now, the last question. Consider iOS and Android as mobile devices. What is the percentage of respondents that discuss that discovered us through social media submitting this from a mobile device? And again, it has to do this. It, this is a bit more trickier because it needs to figure out and it needs to use things like is in. It needs to use things like, uh, you know, maybe a bit of subsetting and then it needs to basically change this condition and condition. Then it finds a shape divided by all of that. And then the thought is that, okay, I know the final answer and that's 18.18% and that's it, all right? So this is kind of a quick a tutorial to how you would use LangChain to query your data, do Q&A against your own CSV, against your own database, but it doesn't matter if it's SQLite, it doesn't matter if it's a remote databases, or if your grandma asks you to help with querying some home recipe, you know, against a CSV fault, then now you know how to do it using uh, OpenAI and using LangChain. And that sums up uh, part two of this series. Uh, in part three, we're gonna go into maybe PDF. We're gonna look into a few more use cases, common use cases, but I wanna keep the video short. Um, I hope you learned something new and I'll see you again in the next video. Thank you, bye.